I want to thank Dr. Colby Brungard for being here to support our webinar and introduce our presenter. Colby, I'm going to turn the webinar over to you so you can introduce the topic in our presenter. Wonderful. Thank you, Sean. So it's my pleasure today to, to introduce Joe Brem, uh, who will be who will be talking about how we generated interpretations outside of NASA. Joe has a, a very varied and an ex extensive background in ecology, uh, soil, and data science. Uh, overall, he has a total of about eight years, nine years now, work experience in leading field research projects, um, sampling design, statistical analysis, leading research crews, uh, and an extensive background in, in both, well, and in programming and data management as well as analytical analysis. Joe's background is in ecology and conservation with a bachelor's degree from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, Joe then worked for the Bureau of Land Management as a, an a assessment inventory and monitoring, or known by the acronym AIM, as a field crew lead. Uh, and then he worked, in the, uh, worked at the Great Basin Institute as a data specialist. Joe then went back to school and got a master's degree from the University of Nevada, Reno, or use remote sensing and, and machine learning to map cheatgrass style across the Great Basin. After graduation, Joe then uh, went to work for the USGS in both uh, field data collection and data analysis. And then it was my privilege to hire Joe to work with me at New Mexico State University uh, on a project uh, to make it possible to incorporate raster data into soil interpretations. So we're getting fairly good at producing soil data using digital soil mapping. And I really feel that the future is now how do we use digital soil mapping and other authoritative data sources to derive better soil use and management interpretations and uh, support end users. And so that's, that's the project that Joe will talk about today, how, uh, how we can generate interpret raster-based interpretations outside of NASA's. And overall, I had just a delightful time working with Joe. I found him to be highly analytical, very self-motivated. Uh, and Joe has also been very adept at understanding the deep and, uh, and the complexities of, of NASA's relationships in, in complicated database. So overall, uh, it's been a, a pleasure to work with Joe. And so Joe, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you for your presentation. Great. Thank you, Colby. Um, I appreciate the introduction and uh, uh, assistance uh, that Sean has been able to provide. Uh, cool. So I am uh, very excited today to talk with you all about um, the uh, interpretations project, um, the, uh, an R engine uh, that will generate uh, a select set of soil interpretations uh, entirely uh, outside of uh, NASIS. <coughs> um, as uh, Sean mentioned, uh, please feel free to ask any questions, and uh, Colby or Sean or I will get to them uh, as we can. Uh, without any further ado, let's get started. Uh, great. So NASA's interpretations, as I imagine uh, most of the people present will know, uh, provide very key information on expected soil behavior. Uh, this is functional uh, applied information that is of interest to a broader audience than soil scientists. Uh, while many of us are uh, quite interested in the intricacies of how soils are created and how they function, uh, for um, a lot of the world, uh, they are more interested in things like hydrologic soil group, which predicts runoff potential, or valley fever habitat, which predicts the range of a particularly deadly pathogen in the American Southwest, or something like dwellings of basements, which just provides a really fundamental limitation to what we can build uh, in our cities and towns. Now, uh, while these interpretations are incredibly valuable and uh, widely used, as they should be, uh, they are only really accessible through NASIS. Uh, and this has uh, two key uh, downsides. First is that it limits user access. Um, NASIS is only really accessible to folks within the NRCS or affiliated with. Um, and uh, this excludes quite a lot of researchers. Uh, second, as Colby mentioned, uh, we're in the midst of the um, uh, increasing availability of uh, digital soil map, map products. This is, of course, not the only outside data source that you might want to use. Uh, and we'll discuss a little bit of that later. Um, 
But uh, by being a part of NASIS, uh, you can only use um, NRCS data that is available to NASIS. And while this is really excellent uh, comprehensive data, you might be interested in something else. Uh, and the interpretations engine will allow you to do that. Uh, before I get to goals, uh, so these, something on the structure of the presentation, we'll do a brief introduction that we're at, already in the midst of, uh, and then I'll be uh, introducing you all uh, to some uh, demonstrations of uh, four of our um, uh, interpretations and just some sort of general discussion. Um, at that point, um, we will kind of switch gears into a um, much crunchier uh, technical uh, discussion. Um, those of y'all that are interested in using this uh, for an input-output, um, certainly stick around if you uh, would like. Uh, but the second portion of this is going to be uh, really diving into the code uh, and looking at how the internal structure of the engine functions, which will be of great interest to those of y'all that want to crack open the hood. Uh, but uh, our engine is uh, designed so that you can get quite a lot of use out of it uh, just from uh, the uh, front end. Now. Uh, the goals from our project uh, that will be uh, introduced to you all to, uh, we propose to develop a prototype interpretations engine that produces soil interpretations using digital soil maps of key soil properties. Now, uh, the interpretations working group chose five uh, widely used interpretations to begin. Hydrologic soil group, uh, or HSG, as we'll refer to it from now on. Uh, soil vulnerability index. Uh, wind erodibility group and index the dwellings with basements interpretation, and valley fever habitat uh, interpretation. Uh, now, I believe these were chosen because they are uh, the most widely used, most widely requested uh, of the interpretations, and that provided a really great starting ground. Uh, now, just a brief overview of the methods and how this works. Um, so we've translated the internal workings of NASIS to a suite of R scripts that are designed for multiple levels of proficiency. Uh, at its most basic, as I mentioned, this engine can be as little as two steps. Load your data, obviously uh, the implied process your data, make sure the units are right, make sure the resolution, all of these uh, things that you have to do every time. Uh, and then once you have that, run the function. Um, now, the interpretations engine will function with uh, any data source, not just the NRCS data, uh, although that is um, it's going to be your starting ground for most of these uh, for reasons that we'll get into a little later. Uh, and uh, while we have designed this with uh, digital soil map and raster data in mind, uh, it will also function on vector and non-spatial data uh, to get a little into the R programming. Um, the engine functions on data frame shape data. Um, so anything that can be transformed into a data frame will we'll be able to run through the engine as long as you know column names are right and uh, all of that. Now, uh, we validated uh, this data set, um, internal workings of NASIS, uh, against uh, what we generated. Um, and uh, through this process, uh, unfortunately, one of our targeted interpretations didn't achieve an acceptable level of parity. Uh, this was the wind erodibility group and index. Um, this is uh, due to uh, how it exists in NASIS. It's in a little bit of a special state. Uh, it's very complex interpretation uh, that exists in a large block of code. And unfortunately, because we don't have intermediate steps, that really limits our ability to bug hunt. And so while we got this interpretation functioning at uh, 80 to 90 percent accuracy, um, really with the way this is structured, we should be able to get up to 100. Uh, and um, while, while uh, maybe able to return to this later, this is uh, unfortunately one of our goals that we were not able to reach. Uh, now, with that bad news out of the way, uh, let's talk about some uh, much nicer things. Uh, so as we go through, uh, I just want to put a couple questions in y'all's heads, um, thinking about how you might uh, use the interpretations engine. Um, we'll um, uh, request y'all put some answers in chat, and we'll discuss them uh, towards the end of this. Um, but we want to know uh, two things. First, uh, what data sources would be useful here? Uh, as a hint, NASA's interpretations are almost entirely based on soils, topographic, and climatic data. Uh, and then some of these variables are going to benefit from a higher spatial resolution uh, when we make the switch from uh, exclusively vector-based data to vector or raster data. Um, and 
you know, uh, all these, these variables vary uh, over different scales, um, soils and topography on uh, moderate to fine scales, and then things like climate on much broader. Uh, so anything with um, a finer scale of variation in nature uh, is going to be particularly benefited by this engine. Uh, so as I said, we'll, we'll come back to those. So just think on them as we're going. Now, uh, the interpretations engine is kind of two, um, two sort of workflows uh, that will look identical to the base level user. Um, but I, I think they're worth discussing in turn. So the first is going to be for hydrologic soil group and soil vulnerability index. Uh, to use the uh, precise um, NASIS uh, parlance, these are actually calculations. Uh, they're relatively simple functions that make use of pretty wide data um, rather than the interpretations proper, which we'll get to next. So uh, step one in your workflow is this. Acquire your data, process, resample, make sure the units are right, all of your um, basic level um, things to check when you get a new data source to, to look at. Now once you have that, or, sorry, um, so the data needed by uh, hydrologic soil group is the KSAT of the most limiting layer, uh, the depth to a restrictive layer, and the depth to a water table, while uh, soil vulnerability index needs first hydrologic soil group, uh, and then also slope and the KW erodibility factor. Um, so as I said, these are pretty widely available data. Um, they're, um, I, I, we, we know what these mean. We can understand what these mean on a um, uh, pretty fundamental level. Um, oh, there's my button. Um, yeah, so, and then once you have that data, it's a single line function. Um, HSG calc of your input brick um, or SDI calc of your input raster brick. Uh, and this will be all you need, provided your data is set up right, it'll go. Uh, now, I'll demonstrate these areas uh, in uh, one particular area, uh, my home county of Grand County, Utah, uh, in the uh, eastern central portion of the U.S. state of Utah. Uh, here's a little satellite image of the area, uh, just to give you all a um, bird's eye uh, sense of what's, what's going on here. Uh, so this here uh, is the Colorado River, uh, and the Green River over here on the western border. Um, we have uh, largely sandstone, almost entirely uh, sandstone formations uh, with some mountain ranges up in the northeast and the far southeast corners of the county. Uh, I-70 runs through this area. It's a relatively flat, a uh, lot of rangeland. Uh, and then, of course, Arches National Park uh, right around here uh, and the town of Moab right about here. Uh, this is me right here. Uh, this is where I'm, I'm coming to you live from. Uh, so for an on-the-ground look, uh, this uh, photo on the top right is a fairly typical view of the landscape in the area. As I said, sandstone, we've got our, our redstone, red soil, uh, largely arid shrubland, almost entirely arid shrubland, rather, uh, with the exception of the mountains and some riparian areas. Uh, a lot of these very dramatic cliffs, uh, pretty much all over the whole area, um, again, made of sandstone. You can actually see a little bit of the banding, uh, which is kind of cool in this photo. Um, and this down here is the uh, town of Moab, which uh, this is not a very uh, populated area. We have Moab, a few smaller communities uh, around here, and then the town of Green River. Uh, but otherwise, this is um, mostly uh, wilderness. Now, let's move on to hydrologic soil group. Oh, um, yes, yeah, so my, my cursor is not visible. I will be sure not to use that uh, further. Hopefully, that last bit made some sense to you all. Now, uh, so this is the input variables for hydrologic soil group. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is pretty simple uh, input. Uh, we have our limiting KSAT on the left, uh, the depth to restrictive layer in the middle. Both of these data sources are digital soil maps um, in the Polaris Properties data set, uh, really excellent digital soil maps that Colby, among others, um, produced uh, that I strongly recommend for uh, those of you all interested. Uh, and then on the right is a uh, depth to water table. Uh, now, I can only find this data uh, in the Cerdo data set, um, which is not an uncommon story for a lot of these. Um, it sure looks like the entire county is uh, at uh, precisely 201 centimeters to the water table. Uh, this is unfortunately a null value. We have very little data here um, with which to work, um, and it is uh, stored as vector polygon data. It's not a true soil map or digital soil map, rather. Um, 
and uh, the conversion to this produces these uh, pretty blocky uh, data sets, which are still valid um, to uh, um, uh, input for these. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, by combining these uh, with our um, digital soil map, uh, or sorry, with our um, uh, HSG calc single line function, uh, we can do something like this, uh, where we have a digital map, raster data, uh, where uh, if you're not um, familiar with looking at raster data, this is, this is often this sort of pixelation area, uh, but we can see these uh, broad um, swaths of areas with uh, different hydrologic soil groups, areas where we have a uh, different predicted response to areas or in different areas. Uh, so this um, uh, orange area, uh, for example, is um, a lot in the uh, 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 C group. Uh, so next, uh, input for our soil vulnerability index. Uh, we have the KW factor, uh, again, using Polaris. I'm seeing some uh, heated uh, uh, discussion of uh, Polaris versus uh, G-Sergo in the, in the chat. Um, but we still used uh, Polaris properties for KW. Uh, and then a uh, slope raster uh, demonstrated through, oh gosh, Travis is um, uh, correcting me on a lot of things. Uh, turns out a lot of these are not Polaris properties, uh, but were, uh, I suppose, rather sourced to one Travis Nauman um, off of the USGS servers. Uh, apologies for that uh, miscommunication. Now, uh, so you'll also see uh, primary hydrologic soil group uh, is an input here, and we used our own raster uh, as input for that, uh, which is a, a nice little bit of synergy here. And combining these, again, uh, single line function, uh, we get our soil vulnerability index map, uh, where we um, can see some broad scale patterning um, emerging from the processing of these, these raster data. Uh, and while a little noisy, uh, in large part due to the very fine uh, variations in slope, um, we're able to uh, generate this, this pixel map of um, the soil vulnerability index across the area. So uh, let's jump back to methods for the uh, second portion of this when we get into uh, interpretations proper. Um, so these the uh, official parlance. Um, these are um, interpretations proper, um, valley fever and dwellings with basements. Uh, these use some very complicated, very precise soil data uh, that exists within the NRCS realm and may not be accessible uh, elsewhere, unlike before where we were able to get four out of five from digital soil products. Uh, now, and some of this doesn't really exist outside of the NRCS depth to water table, uh, as we saw before being uh, one key example for this. Uh, some of this, uh, however, is really complex derived data um, from things like the USDA in lieu of textures. And this presents a problem uh, because we can't really reasonably expect uh, all y'all to uh, be able to reproduce these uh, precisely. So as a solution, uh, we extract all of this data uh, into uh, a baseline raster, uh, which we will um, be able to provide alongside the engine. So this creates actually a full starting data set uh, that one could use immediately uh, to recreate uh, the NASIS um, interpretations. Um, it is also, um, no, sorry, um, while we did this because of the complex data, while we're at it, why not also get the really simple stuff, things like the annual precipitation, give you something to start with. Um, and then because it's uh, just simply a raster brick, uh, you can pretty immediately substitute in your new and favorite uh, data sources, um, so things like the uh, PRISM mean annual precipitation. So input for these uh, is our uh, NASA's extracted data uh, as our quote unquote baseline. Um, and then this can be substituted in with data from any other source. Um, so PRISM, Polaris, digital elevation model products like Slope, um, it also doesn't need to be a published data set. You could very easily use this on some in-house generations of interpolations from your own field data. Um, anything that can be um, included in the engine, um, anything that uh, models the um, data represented uh, can be plugged in pretty easily. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, workflow for these uh, on the front end uh, is very similar, but it's worth emphasizing some differences. Uh, first, our step zero is going to be uh, advanced users uh, will extract this baseline raster data for you. Uh, this is unfortunately a very slow process, uh, so uh, intention will be to run this over the continental United States, uh, which will take a while, uh, but once generated, we'll be able to um, uh, distribute that. Now, uh, so step one is going to be uh, acquire that uh, baseline raster data. Uh, and then if you so choose, uh, substitute in some rasters. Uh, this is a very simple process. You just need to um, target the uh, correct um, layer within the input brick uh, and then substitute in your, your new, um, uh, new data. And then once that is provided, um, we can uh, just run the interpretation function. Again, single line, VF calc of the input data, DWB calc of the input data. Uh, and that will uh, produce your output. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, these interpretations proper have a lot of very complex input variables. Um, as it sits, uh, the dwellings with basements uh, interpretations engine function requires 17 different data layers, while Valley Fever requires 15. Uh, I bring this up um, largely so I don't immediately overwhelm you with the next few slides, uh, which are going to be a lot of graphs. Uh, so these are the uh, 17 different layers that all go into the um, NASA's interpretation for hydrologic soil group. Um, some of these are um, pretty accessible, things like depth to bedrock or slope percent. Um, others are simply true or false layers, uh, like whether or not the NRCS data shows a, a humus bottom layer or a soil that has been reconstructed with an unstable fill. Um, some of these are uh, entirely uh, missing data, like, for example, the depth to permafrost. This is not relevant data in the state of Utah because we don't have any. Um, you also see, uh, again, our depth to water table data uh, is pretty lacking in this area. Uh, and this particular raster uh, generation does not include the, uh, that 201 uh, sort of null data point. Now, uh, we can combine all these. And again, these are the data layers that we'll be able to distribute um, that you can substitute in if you like. Uh, and we combine all that and produce the dwellings with basements index. Um, and um, as mentioned in the chat, uh, this is a pretty wilderness, very rocky area. Um, not a lot of uh, places you can build basements uh, in the uh, Grand County, um, understandable, I think. Uh, but uh, fortunately, we see uh, in that um, southern central border uh, is the Moab and some surrounding areas. Uh, and then um, on the west central border is the town of Green River and some surrounding areas where Fortunately, we can, we can build uh, quite a bit more. Now, uh, this is just a simple demonstration of our uh, DWB map uh, that we can produce with the information on the previous slide or substituted in data. Um, this next set, this is the data that goes into the Valley Fever Index, um, all very similar uh, in uh, content and structure to before, some things like mean annual precipitation uh, or water retention difference that you might be able to get from other sources. Other things like the number of months that are flooded or uh, whether uh, NASA defines this as a zero biological climate are going to be more specific. Uh, and we can combine all of these, uh, again, single line, and create a raster habitat for the valley fever habitat. Um, now, I suspect uh, those of you all looking at this the first time will be a little alarmed by all of the uh, missing data. Uh, this is actually the interpretation working as intended. It's very conservative. Uh, it does not make predictions in areas where it doesn't have enough data, uh, which I think is quite appropriate for something predicting the um, uh, range of a pretty dangerous pathogen. We certainly wouldn't want uh, to base this on areas where we don't have, have enough data. Um, I bring this up largely, well, A, to diffuse any immediate concerns. Uh, and then B, to discuss NA handling, uh, which is copied out of NASA's, um, as we were able to do, uh, and should we create these. Yeah, so those are my uh, demo uh, samples for the four interpretations uh, that we are able to model at the moment uh, with the interpretations engine. I uh, just want to touch briefly on some other benefits of this process. Uh, first, uh, by moving these functions outside of NASA's interpretation code is more uh, easily accessible to a broader range of users. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, this interpretation code can be modified by users for something like sensitivity analysis uh, or looking at how changing some of these parameters might produce different results. Oh, pardon me. Um, and these, these, I think, are the uh, overall strengths of the engine. Um, now, uh, this concludes the kind of front end uh, basic user level uh, discussion of this. Uh, I want to thank, uh, before any of y'all leave, uh, I want to thank uh, first the authors of some really foundational code uh, that I'm drawing from, uh, namely the SoilDB and AQP packages, of which I see quite a few authors uh, in the participants list. Uh, I particularly want to thank Dylan Bodet, Jason Menachek, and Stephen Roker, all of whom provided some um, really essential code uh, that forms the foundation for a lot of this. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, entire uh, interpretations working group. Won't read all of these names for y'all, um, but uh, these are people who laid the groundwork that I um, certainly wouldn't have been able to um, work through uh, without. Uh, now, I want to um, just return back to uh, those questions I started off with y'all before we get to some of these questions that I'm seeing appearing in the chat. Um, first, I'm um, curious what y'all think about uh, different data sources that might be useful here, uh, and then any variables within those data sources that you think would particularly benefit from this approach. So we'll just hold here for um, 60, 90 seconds or so uh, and see if anyone has any ideas worth discussing. Uh, so we got a just got a very good question uh, in the Q and A uh, that I think is worth bringing up as the group uh, or uh, to the broader audience. Uh, so Steve Campbell asks, uh, are the R scripts and returning an interpretation for each component in the G servo map units, uh, or uh, only for the dominant component? Uh, now, um, as y'all uh, as y'all know, um, component data is not inherently spatial. Um, commonly, uh, the area majority component will be assigned to the map units. Um, the initial brick to be distributed um, will contain the uh, dominant component data, just because we have to choose some way to turn this um, uh, tabular data into a spatial raster. Uh, this is not required, uh, and so I'll discuss a little bit in the uh, technical gory details section next um, about how that could be varied. Um, this, um, this is a part of the code that is editable, um, and uh, anyone interested in cracking it open uh, would be able to vary that by, for example, um, well, we can actually run the interpretations engine on this data before it is rasterized, uh, and then generate things like the uh, highest value fever habitat inter um, index within an area. 
which is quite a bit more uh, informative to our uses than uh, the dominant map component, which is the data that I showed you before. I so, uh, hope this answers your question, Sue. Uh, and a different Joby, uh, not me, uh, asks uh, whether um, uh, or how long does it take to write results um, from this demonstration from the raster bricks. Um, the valley fever and dwellings with basements data, um, while it is slow in the entire pipeline, uh, almost all of the initial data uh, actually, once you have that, it is effectively instant um, over your input raster data or your input data. Um, unfortunately, the uh, way we implemented the hydrologic soil group and SDI data is uh, notably slower. Um, and uh, depending on your uh, resolution and the size of your area, can take minutes to over a broad area. It might be a, might be an hour, might be a lunch break worth of time. Okay, Joe. Well, that well additional ideas come in in the chat. Let's go ahead and move on to the technical section. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, for our technical details, uh, the crunchy portion of this, uh, we're going to go through um, four just uh, four uh, little topics here. Uh, first, jumping into the code structure of uh, both of these uh, halves of the engine. Uh, the uh, hydrologic soil group and SDI data, which is um, built on uh, the R data tree structure from the package of the same name uh, that some of y'all will be familiar with, uh, and the valley fever and dwellings with basements. Uh, while it does use some of this uh, data tree architecture in the earlier stages, the core of the engine um, is accessing the evaluations from uh, some cache NASA's data and reconstructing those, um, accessing them uh, by specific evaluation one at a time. After we get to that, uh, we'll jump into that uh, step zero uh, for the valley fever and dealing with basements that I touched on earlier. So how we access and generate those NASA's properties uh, and then how we turn them into rasters. Uh, some of these points were brought up in uh, some very good questions earlier, uh, but we'll, we'll return to those. Yeah, first, uh, code structure. So uh, as I said, uh, HSG and SDI are based on decision trees that use a aggregate function. Um, these decision trees, uh, something you may have seen before, uh, for example, the example I always jump to uh, is dichotomous keys for identifying plants or invertebrates is something I've encountered quite a lot. And it's essentially the same um, sort of thing. Uh, yeah, uses the data tree package. Um, we write these trees uh, defined in an R data file that is loaded by the engine. Uh, these are all written in R, and because one of our goals here is really um, open it up, let anyone get under the hood as uh, easily as possible. Uh, this is one of the code snippets used to define our hydrologic soil group tree. Um, so the navigator function looks through this data. Uh, it will take the statement defined in the fourth line here, next logical, We'll parse that out into four separate logical statements. Uh, RL, our restrictive layer, distance, or depth, rather, uh, less than 50 centimeters, between 50 and 100, or greater than 100, or uh, not present. It will evaluate those. It will figure out, okay, which one is correct, uh, and then jump to, say, uh, we go to node number two uh, if our depth to restriction is 60, uh, and then it will evaluate the next one. Uh, so as, as mentioned before, this is unfortunately a little bit of a slow function. Um, to be perfectly candid, I think a raster map approach would have been faster. Um, however, we're, we're leaving this in uh, because it is, I think, a good framework uh, for further development of the engine. Um, seeing uh, in chat some uh, requests and interests in broader interpretations, which is, is great. Um, unfortunately, we uh, at the moment are limited to just those five, uh, and it will take further development of the engine to get those. 
So uh, code structure for the other half, uh, dwellings with basements and uh, valley fever, um, these are all um, using fuzzy logic equations uh, that are uh, defined and run within NASIS. Um, we extract all of these uh, from uh, reading some XML in the data cache, uh, and then, um, oh, yeah, here we go. Um, call those by evaluation ID. So here are a couple of um, uh, code snippets again. Uh, so we have our function to evaluate by a specific uh, evaluation ID. Uh, in this case, the uh, sodium adsorption ratio, this uh, SAR variable as I'm calling it, uh, uses evaluation 14999, uh, and um, just by, by running this line, the engine accesses the XML for that interpretation, pulls out the data it needs to uh, define that function, and then uh, it will uh, interpolate those on the fly to the data specified there. Now, um, a lot of the processing in here is hard-coded. Um, things like, well, how do we combine the fuzzy numbers? Uh, so this uh, new code snippet at the bottom is the very last step, or I suppose second to last, because we do classify uh, from the fuzzy number. Uh, but uh, the second to last step from the uh, valley fever interpretation, where we do a lot of square rooting, multiplying, division, uh, there's a, uh, a divisor in there, uh, all of these things being hard-coded. Uh, you may have also noticed in the first one that the second line here, uh, the fuzzy membership number, the membership value rather, uh, is square rooted. Um, again, hard coded. This is to uh, recreate the data within NASIS that uh, it was not able to uh, access through the XML. Um, now, uh, because these are uh, interpolations, uh, we unfortunately can't match the precise graphs that exist within NASIS. So this does limit the uh, validation parity here. Um, it is, uh, however, a um, very close approximation of some uh, data that is um, defined uh, somewhat in, uh, in NASIS. And uh, while you should not expect the precise right, or not right, uh, precise same uh, fuzzy variables, this should represent the data um, comparably to uh, the NASIS structure. Uh, we can do some tuning to uh, fit these a little better. Uh, I've gone through um, these. Uh, if you see in the first line, there is a SIG scale um, parameter here. Uh, this is tuning the uh, scale parameter of a sigmoid model uh, that I ran through uh, quite a lot of values of SIG scale and uh, worked out what we can, what fits the data best, uh, which in this case, parameter of five. Again, these are, are hard-coded but modifiable. Now, uh, getting into step zero, uh, where we access our NASIS property, something that uh, many users will not need to do, uh, is, is our goal here. Uh, we get the representative values from uh, the NASIS web reports. Uh, this could, of course, be reconfigured to look at high or low representative values, but as it stands now, uh, we are looking just at the, uh, the mid-range RV. Um, these the properties to look for are uh, identified in our NASA's data cache uh, drawn out from, from all of that data downloaded from the web reports. Uh, we get relevant, we get RVs uh, from all uh, relevant soil components in the area, which is defined by whatever you get it. Uh, I tend to run it state by state uh, is how I've been working with this, but um, as long as you know all the component IDs for your area, uh, it will work. Now, uh, one problem that we ran into is the NASIS web reports, unfortunately, round all of their values to a whole number. Uh, this can cause some problems, um, most dramatically with albedo. Uh, albedos are almost never zero or one. Uh, however, these are the only values that we can extract from NASIS through this, mention, through this method. Uh, we can, however, get around that uh, by putting in pseudo data. Um, often, this is direct. In the case of albedo, that data is easily accessed. Uh, other times, they are derived uh, from that data, uh, where in, in these cases, we've translated the NASIS code, uh, where all of which is maintained in the uh, script that generates all these. Now, uh, once we have all of our property data for our, our large area, uh, next step is to spatialize that. Um, Yes, so we take our property IDs, our RVs rather, uh, and attach those to our server map unit polygons. Uh, as Joe B, the other Joe B uh, brought up earlier, um, using majority components uh, can produce uh, different results than um, other methods of aggregation. 
uh, but uh, majority component is uh, is our starting ground. Uh, now, um, unfortunately, we run into the uh, limitation here of where we um, are combining data sets from NASA's internal workings uh, to uh, Sergo data, uh, which unfortunately use uh, different uh, reference IDs. Uh, so we have kind of hacked together um, for uh, this stage of the project anyway, uh, a join based on names. Um, however, uh, this is admittedly a little lossy. Um, so uh, uh, planning a better uh, way to connect these data sets, uh, I think would be a big uh, improvement to the engine. As I said, area majority component uh, simply to start with. Uh, however, uh, as I touched on before, um, someone uh, particularly interested in something else can uh, run this set of data uh, directly into actually the uh, interpretations engine. As I mentioned before, uh, it does not have to be explicitly spatial data. Uh, as it is simply in a tabular format at this stage, you can run that and then do your spatial data uh, later. And then once you have that, uh, it's a simple matter of um, turning math unit polygons into rasters, which you can do in R. Um, you can do any, any number of programs, ARC, Q, uh, anything, anything worthwhile that works with spatial data will be able to do this uh, very quickly uh, once you have your aggregated data set. Uh, so again, these, these last two uh, slides here going over how to get the properties and how to get the rasters uh, are in some um, the higher level use of the engine. Um, things that will not be necessary for the um, most basic, uh, most common uses uh, of the engine. So uh, with that, I want to open up to questions again. I'm seeing some really great uh, discussion in the chat um, about our, some of our different data sources, which uh, I think is excellent. And um, our goal of the engine is uh, allowing you all to uh, run some numbers uh, and uh, really, really give yourself some, some um, uh, material to work with uh, as these really worthwhile scientific discussions continue. All right. Thank you, Joe. And I'll just remind people to please put your questions into the Q&A. Helps us to find them. There's been a lot of discussion in the chat, but sometimes the questions get separated by other topics and discussion points. So putting those in the Q&A will help us. Uh, you've answered some of those questions, Joe, that have come in, but uh, there is one more that's just come in. John says, hydrologic soil group could help development of ESDs in Hawaii. Depth to water table and depth to restrictive layer could help me understand distribution of naturalized tree shrub, which takes a tree form where water is available and shrub from where water is restricted. These areas would be assigned as different ecological sites. I'd like to learn how to access and use the interpretations. So more of a comment uh, so than a question. To uh, so access to this, um, we uh, do still need to, to uh, get some, uh, uh, upload the code uh, within the working group, um, get a look at that, um, get some, some outside eyes on it, uh, and then um, actually from there we can distribute that. Um, I personally would be happy to, uh, if you can email me, uh, John, um, I would be happy to uh, forward you that one um, if you would like to uh, run some HSG on some of your own data. Joe, I hear you frantically keying there, but uh, just one question kind of comes to mind. When you were presenting this, you talked about using the representative value a lot, but would you see any value to using a worst case scenario for an interpretation, like a high value? Instead Absolutely. Of uh, in particular for belly fever, um, we, we really want to know what, what's the worst case scenario for uh, uh, distribution of the, of the pathogen. Um, this is um, pretty easily accessible in a portion of the code that generates the baseline data. Um, from all of this response requesting these, um, it might be worth running these, running this three times, um, maybe looking at a high, low, and uh, middle value for the, uh, well, actually, uh, I have to take all that back. Um, the 
aggregation, the generation of worst or best case scenarios uh, will have to be, uh, at the moment anyway, uh, a pretty high level uh, functioning where you open up the script that uh, generates the properties, uh, intercept it at that tabular data stage, uh, and then run from there and spatialize the data there. Um, clearly, this is a this is a good area for uh, for improvement. Joe, I don't know if you were able to monitor any of the chat uh, since this, but one of the comments from Sky is DSP work, dynamic cell properties work, could assign values under different scenarios. And I think you spoke to something like that in your presentation where having this outside of NASIS would allow users to uh, adjust the, re the requirements. Joe, I think you may still be on mute. My mic is absolutely on mute. Thank you, Colby. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, as you said, uh, different scenarios. Um, this would be a um, another sort of higher level use. Uh, it is not uh, currently set up to be um, as user friendly as uh, the most basic uses. Um, but because it's all open source code, uh, you can generate these scenarios uh, and work with those. Any other questions for Joe? Well, Joe, it looks like we've exhausted the questions that have come in. And I want to thank you and Colby for your time and effort to make this presentation. And thanks to all the participants for joining in. We had over 160 people join the webinar. The on-demand recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, along with almost 200 webinars and training videos. Simply search for NRCS NSSC or this topic in YouTube, and you'll find the recording. Please feel free to let your colleagues within and outside of NRCS know about this training opportunity. This concludes our webinar presentation.